my best answer. So hello everyone and um, a warm welcome to the Sen PGI uh, online lecture series. Uh, today is our final talk uh, given in the framework of the education and training program of the Seven Quantum Technology Initiative. Thank you very much for everyone who has been with us uh, throughout uh, the last uh, couple of months and followed the talks. Uh, today, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome Hannah Banks, our final speaker, um, who is a PhD student at the Department of uh, Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. And Hannah will be giving a talk today uh, about the exploration of gravitational waves using the long baseline atom interferometers. It is a great pleasure to have you here with us, Hannah. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, the last comment I would like, just like to say uh, to our audience is, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat um, or raise your hand um, while during the presentation, and we will take the questions as they uh, come in. Thank you so much, and Hannah, um, please go ahead. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks everyone for coming. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about a possible new way that we might be able to exploit quantum technologies to search for new dark sector physics. So there is an abundance of, oh, am I able to change the slide? There we go. There is an, but we've got an abundance of evidence for new physics beyond the standard model. And one of the biggest puzzles with the standard model of particle physics is, of course, dark matter. So we've got all this evidence coming from gravity that dark matter is out there. Yet, despite relentlessly pursuing this for decades, we still have no idea what this is at the particle level, which is quite a sobering thought, really. If it's, it's this is making up 85% of the matter in the universe, um, we don't know what it is, which uh, I think is, is, is quite a, a sobering thought. Now, in light of the fact that our experiments have so far yielded no results, it's become increasingly attractive to consider the fact that possibly dark matter is um, part of some extended hidden sector, which may compose of states over a whole range of scales. OK, so it's not necessarily heavy states. It could be light states. It could be anything in between. And um, there are different ways that we, we can probe these uh, these states. It could be that these states are lying at high energy, so the high energy frontier. Uh, and we can probe those in high energy colliders. So this would be a case for going to higher and higher uh, energy colliders, such as the FCC. However, there is an interesting and tantalizing possibility that we may actually have new states, new light states, uh, which are which have been hidden from us so far, not by an inaccessible energy barrier, but perhaps by some incredibly weak or feeble coupling to the standard model. Now. The recent transformative advances that we've seen in quantum sensing technologies have made it possible for the very first time for us to begin to probe this scenario. So there's been a huge range of uh, new avenues that have been opened up uh, by these developments that we've been seeing in quantum sensing technologies. And in particular, what's been relevant uh, to fundamental physics has been um, developments in, in quantum control. So being able to uh, precisely control uh, both atoms and photons and precisely uh, control and manipulate these states, uh, which has then opened up the ability to measure things like forces and fields to incredibly high precisions. And it's this which has really allowed us to develop a new and innovative set of new avenues for probing fundamental physics. Now, a particular um, way that is, this has been realized is through atom interferometers. So I'll just give you a little rundown of what an atom interferometer is. So those of you that may be familiar with like a typical optical interferometer. So if you think obviously the like LIGO program looking for gravitational waves, that's that's an optical interferometer. Um, but any of you that ever did a, an experiment in school, maybe with a Max Zender interferometer, it's, it's kind of the same thing. But instead of splitting light, what we do is we have atoms. So essentially what you have is you have some atomic state. Um, you then use a laser. And what that laser does is the laser basically splits your state. It's You initially prepare your system in the ground state, and it splits it into uh, an excited state and the ground state. You then let these propagate for a bit. Then after some time, you then... Uh, flip them. So anything that was in the excited state goes to the ground state, and anything that was in the ground state goes to the excited state. And again, you let that propagate for a little bit. And then finally, what you do is you recombine these two things so that they interfere. And what you then measure 
at the output is essentially the phase difference between light has, that has traveled along this path and light that has traveled along this path. Okay. And they will have a different phase difference because when it spends time in the excited state, um, it accumulates phase at a quicker rate than it does in the ground state. So while it's in the excited state, it's accumulating phase quicker than the ground state. And because the time between these two, uh, like the time spent here and the time spent here are not necessarily equal, these two paths spend different times in the excited state and therefore accumulate different phases. So what you measure at the output port is the phase difference that goes between um, atoms which have gone through this path and have gone through this path. Now, how might we use this to detect gravitational waves? So this is just a single atom interferometer. So in order to use it as a gravitational wave detector, what you actually need is you need two of these things. So you'd have one, say, up here and one down here, and they'd be separated by some distance L. Now, what you then do is you'd operate these things with a, um, a single laser. So these, the laser that you're firing vertically, that would operate both of these atom interferometers at the same time. And now, if you imagine you've got a gravitational wave coming in between, like in the vertical direction, that um, gravitational wave is going to modify the distance, the distance L between your atom interferometers. Um, and as a result, um, the light, obviously the light has some finite travel time. This is going to lead to a difference in the phase difference that your first atom interferometer measures and your second one measures. So essentially the observable that you're measuring when you're using these atom interferometers as a gravitational wave detector is the difference in phase differences between two atom interferometers. And that allows you, it gives you uh, some measure of um, whether you've got a gravitational wave in your system. So what is the status of atom interferometers? Well, in order to use them, in order to reach the sensitivities that are relevant to gravitational wave detection, you actually need to build these with a long baseline. So that's where your, your L, your distance between your two atom interferometers is um, really quite microscopic. It's, we're talking sort of um, hundreds of meters to kilometers. So there have been a range, or there are a range of kind of prototype atom interferometer experiments, which are currently in development. So these include the AION-10, which is being built in Oxford in the UK. We've got uh, MAGIS-100 in the US. Then uh, there's also uh, MEGA, the Very Long Baseline Atom Interferometer, which is in, being built in Hanover, and uh, Zega, which is in China. So these are all uh, currently in development, and they're basically allowing us to assess the technology readiness levels to then upscale these to the kilometer scale. And sort of the proposed time scale for this is by, by about the mid 2030s. So by about the mid 2030s, they're hoping to have, uh, fingers crossed that they get the funding, uh, but they're hoping to have um, built uh, atom interferometers, which can operate over a baseline of, of around the 100, uh, sorry, about the kilometer scale. And um, in fact, one interesting thing is the AION 10, um, that's like between the AR on 10 and the AR on kilometer, they have the AR on 100 and the AR on 100 might be used for, for searching for ultralight dark matter. Um, but essentially, uh, that a proposed site for that might be at CERN. So, uh, there are links between these experiments and CERN, hopefully. Um, and provided they can get these kilometer scale things to work. Uh, if they can get the funding, kind of the the end goal would be to get one of these things in space. If you can have a space-based one, um, that would actually reduce a lot of the noise. So a big problem for these terrestrial-based atom interferometers is uh, like seismic vibrations from 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 the Earth, but those could be eliminated if you had it in space. So the kind of the space-based space-based atom interferometer would be the kind of end goal. But for that, we're looking on a, a much longer time scale, so sort of about the 2040s. And again. Uh, this is all uh, providing that funding can be sourced. So what is unique about using atom interferometers for gravitational waves? Well, you may be aware of gravitational wave searches that have been performed at LIGO-Virgo. So LIGO-Virgo are, of course, um, these detectors which are based on Earth using their optical-based detectors. And these have been tremendously successful in detecting uh, resolved mergers 
of solar mass compact binary objects uh, whose merger, whose characteristic merger frequency is between sort of like 10 to the 1, 10 to the 4 hertz. So that's LIGO. It's been tremendously successful to start with. Another gravitational wave program of the future is uh, the LISA experiment, which is going to be able to detect gravitational waves of uh, much, much lower frequencies. But these atom interferometers are unique because their unique properties are allowing us to probe uh, what we call the gap between the LISA and uh, the LIGO, exper LIGO experiment. So this is going to be a unique and complementary way of our current uh, gravitational wave uh, exploration programs which is giving us a unique access to these mid-band frequencies. And this is really exciting because it allows us to probe uh, new sources potentially of gravitational waves and therefore new fundamental physics. So the kind of motivation of this work was we, we knew we have these atom interferometers. We know that they're going to be probing a new uh, region of um, frequency space. And kind of our motivation was, well, what, uh, what sort of signals and what sources might these things be sensitive to? Now, the kind of case for gravitational waves at atom interferometers has kind of been based on two uh, different types of searches. So one way that people have considered using atom interferometers to search for gravitational waves is to look for resolved mergers. So just like they've done at LIGO, uh, but... Instead, because they're operating at lower frequencies, they're looking at uh, objects which are merging at uh, higher masses. OK, so these are kind of you may have heard of spec kind of um, speculative possibility of there being intermediate mass black holes, uh, which may, for example, arise from uh, the mergers that like the successive mergers of stellar mass black holes. So these um, intermediate mass black holes, we don't know whether they exist. But if they did, we'd expect them to merge in the uh, frequency band that's accessible to these atom interferometers. And therefore, looking for their resolved mergers would make uh, an interesting possible target. So that's one thing people have considered. And the second thing people have considered are looking from stochastic backgrounds. So these are like kind of the cumulative total of uh, unresolved signals that are coming from cosmology. So there are a number of interesting features in the early universe which could, uh, for example, cause um, gravitational waves. And uh, some of these things include like first order phase transitions, cosmic strings. Uh, and again, uh, this there's been a case a case for using gravitational uh, waves at atom interferometers to, to probe these things. Now, in this work or today, I'm going to be interesting introducing you to a new way that we might be able to use atom interferometers. And it's actually looking at the gravitational wave landscape through a new lens. So before I've introduced you to both resolved mergers and stochastic surges for cosmological backgrounds. So today I'm going to introduce looking at the gravitational wave landscape, but looking at it through um, the gravitational wave background that's coming from binaries. So in essence, we're using the same populations that we considered here. Well, not necessarily the same, it's not intermediate mass black holes, but looking at astrophysical populations, we're looking, but instead of looking at resolved mergers, we're looking at their cumulative total. And this can be characterized in a very nice way. We, we can, you can, uh, in fact, this is the same uh, observable that you'd use for a, back, a normal stochastic background search. Uh, it's dimensionless, and it's basically the dimensionless logarithmic uh, energy density spectrum of these sources. And uh, crucially for today, um, unlike when you do a stochastic search and you only include unresolved signals, I'm going to be considering uh, treating both resolved and unresolved. So basically, it's measuring everything which comes into your detector. And as we'll see, not only does this reveal a very important astrophysical signal that you need to, to take into account at atom interferometers, but also using specifically the unresolved and resolved signals, it actually offers a new and entirely unique way of probing the dark sector. So what, how can we calculate a gravitational wave background? Well, as I've said, the, the observable of interest is this omega. And um, what exactly, how exactly can we calculate that? So it turns out we don't need to really worry about too much about the details here, but it turns out this can be uh, calculated provided that you know a number of different things. 
So there's some input from cosmology, and typically one just assumes a standard cosmology. You then need to know your differential merger rate of your objects. And that depends on their current merger rates, their, their, their merger date rate in the present day. You need to know what the mass distribution of these objects are, and you also need to know how they're distributed in Redshift. Now, in addition to this, you need to know what the energy density spectrum is um, for a single binary system. So this typically uh, depends on your, your wave forms of the in-spiral merger and the ring down phases. And one thing which I'm going to just highlight now, because it's going to be quite crucial uh, to the rest of this talk, is that actually during in-spiral, whatever the object is, um, because you're modeling it during in-spiral, so that's when the, the two things in your, in your binary system are uh, going around each other and orbiting each other and getting closer and closer together. Um, during in-spiral, we can treat them as point objects. So actually their waveform is known at the analytical level. That's something you can calculate directly um, from uh, general relativity. And crucially, if you find that this omega actually scales as frequency to the power of two over three. So this is a really characteristic signal of an in-spiral. If you've got two objects which are in-spiraling, um, you would expect uh, their energy density spectrum to scale with frequency to the power of two thirds. So this is a really characteristic uh, scaling that you'd expect to see for the in spirals of objects. Okay, so we've illustrated um, how we might be able to, to look at these gravitational wave backgrounds. But the next thing is, well, what sources might produce a gravitational wave background in this frequency spectrum? So we've already mentioned that LIGO, remember LIGO is looking at objects which are merging at like 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 4 hertz. That's detected lots and lots of black holes, neutron stars and binary hole, uh, neutron star pairs, uh, which are which have masses that are kind of solar masses. So we, by solar mass, I mean kind of the order of 10 uh, solar masses. So we know these objects exist. We know there are populations of what we call solar mass, uh, binary compact objects in our universe. However, as we said, their frequency is above the frequency bound that's probed by AI on. However, that's not actually a problem because um, while these objects are in spiraling, so if you look at this is kind of like the waveform of a, some binary uh, system that's merging, even though like the peak amplitude is when they merge, so that's here, uh, and obviously this is at some high frequency, these, these uh, peaks are close together, it's high frequency. When you look at lower frequency, sorry, when you look kind of earlier in time, so while they're in spiraling, you can see that it's actually emitting gravitational waves just with a much, much lower frequency. So actually these objects, uh, which are uh, merging, that we know are out there, these populations of, as I said, stellar mass, uh, binary black holes, binary neutron stars, and black hole neutron stars, we know they will be actually emitting lower frequency radiation, which is in the AI ion band. Or when I say AI ion, that's just an example of, of an atom interferometer. Um, so these should be a potential source um, for atom interferometers. And what's interesting about this is because, or well, the reason we're perhaps looking at the background is although we're not looking at when they're at their peak frequency, we're looking at their lower, sorry, their peak uh, amplitude. We're looking at lower amplitudes. The reason we're looking at a background is because we're then adding all of these uh, things together in order to get perhaps a signal which is observable. Now, the reason this is an interesting target is because of the observe um, the observations that have been seen at uh, LIGO. We actually have an experimental handle on these populations. So. From the observations of individual mergers that they've seen at LIGO, they've been able to extract properties of these populations, for example, their mass distribution and uh, the rate that they're presently merging at. And this means that we know the characteristics of this population very, very well. And as a result, this gives us the input that we then need to use the equation that we've got here to actually calculate what uh, the energy density is at lower frequencies. So the first thing that we started uh, with, with this work was thinking about, OK, so we've got these objects. We know that they're emerging at high frequencies, so we know what their populations are. Can we then calculate and extrapolate what their signal would be uh, for atom interferometers? So that's exactly what we went and did. So on the left-hand side here, 
I've calculated uh, the signal that you'd expect from binary black holes in, in the purple, binary neutron stars in the lilac, and the black hole uh, neutron star pairs. So these are kind of the signals that you'd expect to see. And uh, crucially, there are a number of interesting characteristics associated with this. So crucially, if you look at the scaling, you can see it's scaling as two thirds, as expected. So all the way it's a straight line. This is during in spiral. Um, the end of the in spiral kind of happens here. Uh, and this would be where you've got the ring down and uh, the, sorry, the merger and the ring down. And it actually turns out that if you want kind of a rough, I mean, technically you need to know the exact form of the wave function to know exactly where it cuts off. But if you want a kind of crude approximation, and uh, the crude approximation is just to use the innermost, uh, the frequency when these objects are in their innermost stable circular orbit. So actually, this calculation does use the entire wave functions. Um, but as you will see when we come on to, to investigating perhaps more hypothetical objects that we don't have a handle on, um, it turns out that, that using this frequency is actually a very good approximation of where uh, the, um, the in spiral ends. OK, so this is what the calculation is. But is this going to be relevant for our atom interferometers? So to that end, we need to think about various different interferometers. So what I've got on this graph is the, the blue band or the central blue line basically is just the addition of all these three sources. So this is like my estimate of the total astrophysical background that you'd expect from black hole neutron stars, binary neutron stars and binary black holes. And what I've got in all the colors are what we call um, one sigma uh, power law integrated sensitivity curves. So basically anything that's above the curve, you'd expect to detect uh, with a signal to noise ratio of one. So as you can see, uh, our signal, our blue band is really cutting all of these, uh, well, not all of them, but it's cutting the atom interferometer. So here I've got the AI on kilometer. So this is the UK based atom interferometer at the kilometer level. Um, the purple one here is the A-edge. This is the space-based one. This is a, a future space-based one that might be, uh, you know, even, even further in the future. Um, this, this is the A-ion 10. So as you can see, the A-ion 10 is not really, so A-ion 100, that's not really going to be very useful for looking at gravitational waves. And this purple line here is the LISA. So we can see that this signal, not only is it going to be interesting for atom interferometers, but it's also going to be very, very relevant to, to the to LISA experiment in the future. Um, but here's LIGO up here. So actually, this, this background that we're seeing from astrophysical objects, this is something which hasn't been accessible to LIGO yet. It may be accessible to LIGO, like future versions of LIGO, but actually this signal is something which is we haven't detected before, but we will be able to detect, uh, certainly, with atom interferometers and, and LISA in the future. So what are the implications of the fact that this signal is well within reach of these atom interferometers? What does that mean for us? Well, the first thing to note is that actually this, what I'm calling now a signal, this is actually going to be a background for any other source of gravitational waves that you want to search for. So I mentioned earlier that people were looking for perhaps stochastic backgrounds from gravitational waves. And it turns out their predictions for them are actually below, a lot of them are actually below this astrophysical background. So actually, this, this signal here is going to prevent you, or make it perhaps more challenging, to search for other weaker sources of um, gravitational waves. And not only is it um, relevant to searches for um, result, um, stochastic backgrounds, but also it's uh, relevant to when you're trying to do a resolved search. So if you were looking for intermediate mass black holes, you'd need to know what this background is because this would enter your signal to noise ratio uh, calculation uh, for when you subtract the resolved merger from the total signal. So it turns out that this is a very, very relevant signal. This is not something which anyone has pointed out before uh, as being relevant for atom interferometers. So I guess a big thing that I'd like to, to get across today is that this really is going to be a relevant signal, um, certainly for atom interferometers in the future. And it's something which is going to be needed to, to take into account when, when planning gravitational wave exploration programs at these experiments. 
But the second thing is actually, this is a signal in its own right. This is something that we would be interested in studying. And it turns out there's a whole host of information uh, that you can extract from such a curve. So because you're looking at like a cumulative total, um, it turns out this is entirely complementary to studying the same population in terms of their individual mergers, as was done at LIGO. So actually, whereas LIGO only really manages to probe the objects which are nearest to us, so objects at, at low redshift, um, by looking at the cumulative total, you're able to access much, much higher redshifts than you'd be ever able to do when you're looking for resolved signals. So this is going to allow us to get a much better handle on populations of uh, black holes, binary neutron stars, uh, and uh, pairs of the two. And another thing you can do, because instead of when, when you're making a measurement, because again, your measurement depends on lots and lots of objects, it means you're able to extract um, like the characteristics of the population as a whole. So instead of just measuring the masses of the two objects that are merging, um, you're able to kind of get uh, a much um, broader idea of, of the population characteristics as a whole. So the kind of their distribution of, of masses and their distribution of binary occurrence rates. And another thing you can do is you can find out how like the mass varies as a function of redshift. So there are a lot of characteristics of, of these systems which you can extract by doing this kind of measurement that you wouldn't get uh, from looking at for their resolved mergers at LIGO. And not only is it things like masses and binary occurrence rates, but actually things like black hole angular momentum, then the ellipticity of the neutron star, uh, magnetic fields of the neutron star. So all things which could actually impact their, uh, their gravitational wave emission. Um, a final or not a final, but another thing is it's a huge importance of, to astrophysics. So you can probe a, a variety of different um, astrophysical um, properties which are relevant to other areas of astrophysics, such as stellar formation rates, um, how metallicity evolves with redshift. So these are all things which enter standard astrophysical cal calculations in like um, like parts of astrophysics which are very, very different from gravitational wave astronomy. Um, so being able to, to know or get a better handle on these things is actually very, very important uh, to the field of astrophysics as a whole. And a final um, exciting possibility is that um, if your black holes, so if instead of just having like uh, black holes that have formed from the collapse of stars, if we had so-called primordial black holes, which formed in the early universe, uh, if there was, uh, if, the, if they were contributing to a gravita the gravitational wave signal, um, that would also potentially be uh, observable in this line. So if you had some additional population of primordial black holes, uh, it would be potentially able to, to probe the possibility of them contributing to this. So there's a lot of interesting things that you can get from really probing uh, the shape of this, this spectral um, function. So if you're really probing the spectral function in, in different frequency bands, so for example, Lisa can probe it down here, Aon can probe it up here. We can really see whether this gradient is two thirds. If it's not two thirds, there's probably something else going on, which we'll come to uh, perhaps in a second. Um, but it really allows you to get a much better handle on these objects uh, and their astrophysical characteristics. And indeed, uh, the signal is something which is of great interest and has been identified um, as being of, of interest in, in, in LISA. Uh, but it is yet to have been, been considered for the point uh, for from the perspective of atom interferometers, which is kind of what I'm highlighting uh, here today. So I was talking earlier about how this may provide us with a unique way of probing the dark sector. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have an abundance of evidence for dark matter in the universe, but despite relentlessly pursuing it, uh, we've yet to find any evidence of its non-gravitational uh, interactions. And it could actually be that dark matter is actually entirely decoupled uh, non-gravitationally uh, from the standard model. It may be that uh, the, the dark matter doesn't actually interact at all, or if it does, it may, may interact just extremely feebly. So actually looking for dark matter through gravitational waves uh, is actually a unique and exciting uh, possibility. 
Now, in particular, um, we want to think, so we, we, I said earlier, there's kind of, it's become increasingly attractive to consider that dark matter is perhaps part of some extended sector. So it's not just a single dark matter particle, but you might have particles over a whole range of states. What could this dark sector look like? So to this end, we can but look to the standard model for inspiration. So in the standard model, it's extraordinarily rich and diverse. And this is right from the microscopic level. We've got a plethora of different uh, fundamental fields involved in the standard model. Um, but actually going up to like the objects that we see on astrophysical levels, we've got, you know, we see black holes, we see white dwarfs, brown dwarfs, red giant stars. Uh, we see supernova. Um, you know, interstellar medium, there's a huge range of uh, diversity and richness that we see on all scales in our universe. So actually, it's probably too simplistic just to think of the dark sector as just being composed of a single dark matter particle. As I've said, it's, it's increasingly likely that this dark sector is composed of uh, a whole range of new states. And um, such states could have a variety of different properties as they do in the standard model and could exist over a great range of scales, again, as we see in the standard model. Now, if we did have such new states, um, it's entirely possible that these states could coalesce under gravity and that like we see in the visible sector, they could form extended macroscopic compact objects. So to this end, I'm thinking about things like fermion stars, boson stars, dark matter stars. So these are all um, objects which have received uh, a lot of uh, interest uh, in, um, in in various uh, areas of theoretical physics. So with boson stars, we're thinking about things like axion stars or Alp stars. Um, so it's entirely plausible such objects could exist. And if these objects form binaries, um, then perhaps they, well, definitely, they would uh, produce gravitational waves uh, from their in spirals and potential mergers. So actually, these objects, which, uh, as I've tried to argue so far, are not only uh, possible, but possibly quite probable, uh, these, these objects could actually be an additional source of gravitational waves. So how might we estimate this? So these objects that I've, I've just discussed, um, they're entirely... Uh, hypothetical. So we don't actually know anything, well, we don't know much about their possible formation mechanisms or their properties. We haven't observed them. So unlike for the LIGO populations I was talking about, we don't know what their merger rates are or their masses or anything like that. So we can but estimate. And again, we can use the visible sector to guide us. So what I've got, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to estimate what the gravitational uh, like to order of magnitude, what the gravitational wave um, background from these, these exotic compact objects might look like using the visible sector as a guide. So I'm going to just do a very simple assumption that we've got populations of exotic compact objects um, which have the same mass. So you've got two black holes of the same mass um, in a binary. And then you've got multiple copies of those binaries that form some population. So they've, every every single black hole in the population has the same, uh, well not black hole, eco in the population has the same mass. Um, I'm going to just take the same redshift distribution and the same present day merger rate as the LIGO black holes. And then in order to take into account that we don't really know what the waveforms of these things are going to be like, the lower limit of these curves is going to just assume that we, we account for in-spiral only. So this is kind of like the minimum uh, frequency cutoff you'd expect. And um, this upper one is using the waveforms that you'd expect for black holes. So this is kind of a conservative estimate of the uncertainty that we might have in the frequency of this cutoff. So what do we actually find? So what I've got here are where the objects are of 2,000 solar masses, or the, 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 the sorry, their, their total mass, the total mass of the binary is 2,000. So each uh, object is 1,000 solar masses. Here the total is 200. And here the total is 20. So, and they're all merging at the same rate. Um, so that's actually 10 mergers uh, per giga year. That's uh, minus three. Um, so this is what we've uh, got going on 
here. Um, and this gives us some very, very interesting things uh, to think about. So imagine you're doing, you're, you're an experimenter and you're doing this experiment. Now you'd expect to see something scaling as two thirds so like this uh, going down here. But imagine you actually see something which is significantly, it's got some vast uh, discrepancy between your expected signal. Now, if you were measuring this and you were saying that it also had a frequent, uh, it had a scaling of two thirds, that's really actually a smoking gun for some kind of new population of binary merging objects. Um, so this is really a smoking gun for some kind of dark, dark sector physics. And as you can see, these signals can be extremely large. They can be significantly over the astrophysical background. So this really would be uh, a smoking gun uh, signal. And the second thing that's of interest is, again, we've got all these different detectors of the future. Actually measuring the, the magnitude of, of this signal in different detectors is very, very interesting. Because imagine if you saw, for example, a very big signal uh at uh, AI, uh for example at um i don't know ai on but you didn't see a signal at all at future versions of lisa that's telling you that this object is cutting off somewhere in between um ai on and uh, ligo and why is that interesting well as we'll see the cutoff scales inversely with the mass so the the higher mass objects their, their cutoff, their, their, the frequency at which uh, we stop seeing gravitational emission is actually much before uh, lower mass objects. So not only uh, are we able to, to perhaps uh, detect the existence of these objects, but we're getting some idea on what their possible mass is. And yes, there is uncertainty uh, associated with this, but it is giving you a kind of order of mass estimate of what the mass of these objects might be. And why is that interesting? Well, that's interesting because the mass, like depending on what states, what states on the microscopic level these objects are formed from, that's going to impact the possible masses that they may have. So actually, if you um, were able to use the mismatch between the extrapolated signals at different detectors to kind of estimate what the cutoff would be, uh, that's then going to tell you a lot about the underlying physics, and therefore it's really probing complexity on uh, a in the dark sector on a very very fundamental level. So probably at this point you're thinking, well, is this feasible? At the moment, all I've said is I'm using the same uh, present day merger rate as um, the LIGO black holes. Is that a reasonable thing to do? So to this end, I'm going to tell you that this line here corresponds to a fraction of the total dark matter in the universe of 10 to the minus 5, sorry, 10 to the minus 3 being in uh, these objects. This green one is 10 to the minus 4, and this, this uh, green one is, the dark green one is 10 to the minus 3. So I guess what I'm trying to say is even if, so I'm not suggesting that all dark dark matter forms compact objects, even if it's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction, so 10 to the minus 5, um, you're beginning to see 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3, you're actually seeing a, a signal uh, which is well above the astrophysical background. And we can formalize this uh, in a bit more of a, a quantitative way. So actually, if I define this parameter eta to be the fraction of dark matter, which is held within these, these eco-binaries, that's just the fraction, the, the energy density of these echoes uh, divided by the energy, total energy density of dark matter, you can calculate it according to this um, uh, parameter where E just basically tells you what fraction of them merge um, in a Hubble time scale, have merged, the total have merged in a Hubble time scale. Um, and we can then calculate what fraction eta we need in order to uh, exceed both the astrophysical background and the instrument sensitivity. So going to this curve, that's like, is it above the instrument sensitivity and is it above the astrophysical background? So it's essentially telling us what fraction we need in order to see these objects. And as you can see, we're looking at really, really tiny uh, numbers. OK, so perhaps if it's just 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, even here we're saying down to 10 to the minus 8, so really, really tiny fractions. And that makes it a much more 
reasonable and plausible scenario. I mean, it wouldn't be if I was telling you that we needed all of dark matter in order to be, for the signal to be to be um, visible. That wouldn't be a very reasonable thing to say because it's likely that such a scenario, all of dark matter being in compact objects, is probably ruled out by a multitude of cosmological. Well, it is ruled out by a multitude of cosmological experiments. However, uh, just being some tiny fraction, that's becoming a much more plausible uh, scenario. So this is a really, really exciting possibility. So atom interferometers are really going to be a smoking gun for detecting perhaps if these objects do exist and perhaps even uh, being able to probe more about them. And as I've said, particularly as dark matter is proving so elusive, this might be, this gravitational waves might be one of the only ways uh, that we actually have a foot in the door uh, for studying uh, dark sector and dark matter. So just to kind of summarize what we've talked about today, um, we've said, so we started off looking at the astrophysical objects, and we said that the background from these stellar mass binaries that we've seen at LIGO, that's definitely going to be observable at atom interferometers. And that's something that we're going to need to take into account um, as, as a relevant background if you're looking for gravitational waves of any other source. Um, but also, the signal is very, very interesting in its own right. And there's an abundance of interesting astrophysical information that could be extracted. Um, and this is something which we should really be targeting uh, at these experiments. But not only is this interesting from an astrophysical point of view, um, but there's actually, in terms of fundamental physics, a lot that these atom interferometers could do. So we've argued that exotic compact objects, so things like dark matter stars, action stars, um, these are not only uh, plausible, but actually potentially quite probable. Um, and even if they harbor just some tiny fraction of the dark matter, so even if they're out there, but only with some very, very, very small abundance, it's actually possible that these could produce really significant signals in our atom interferometers that we could potentially distinguish uh, from the astrophysical signal. So in particular, we looked at two different ways. So if you saw um, some mismatch between the extrapolated and the observed signal, we said that's really uh, a smoking gun for a new binary population. And you can see that just from looking at in one detector alone. But actually, if you were seeing discrepancies between different detectors, that would allow you uh, to probe um, the cutoff of their, their frequency spectrum and in turn their mass. And, and that's telling you about the underlying states in your dark sector. So it's really allowing you to probe uh, the dark sector, the complexity of the dark sector on a fundamental level. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you that this is, uh, atom interferometers have a lot to reveal about the universe and that they make uh, for very, very exciting experiments. And there's certainly, this is really only scraping the surface of the capabilities of these experiments. There's a lot that they could uh, be able to access uh, in terms of fundamental physics in the future. So do keep your eyes peeled as these experiments um, go from prototype to uh, being scaled up and eventually become operational. So I think that's probably all I was going to say today. So uh, thanks very much for, for listening with your time. And do let me know if you've got any questions. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. And um, we are now also giving you a possible round of applause. Um, hopefully we cannot uh, give it to you in person, but thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, yes, the floor is open now for questions. So please uh, feel free to ask questions uh, or put them in the chat. Um, to I'm also happy for people to email me if they don't have questions now or, you know. <laughs> yes, it's, it's an opportunity to send you a message. Uh, so this, will, this will be nice for sure. And also, um, I would like to remind everyone that the recording of this talk will be made available on the event Indico page. And also the material, uh, so this, today's presentation will be also made available on the Indico page and also on the quantum.sen website. So if you would like to go through the material again and maybe you have a question sent, you can always uh, uh, reach out to Hannah. Thank you, Hannah, for this opportunity and uh, ask ask. Uh, the question. Um, I would also like to remind everyone that uh, in case you missed any of the previous talks, um, the recordings of the talks are available uh, on the quantum.sen website and also on the same YouTube channel. So make sure or feel free to, to uh, visit the sites and to see the lectures, the lectures that you might have missed. Um, on my side, I would very much like to thank Hannah again. It's really, really clear that you're passionate about your research, about the topic. And uh, this was 
uh, very inspiring because exactly this was the idea of uh, of this lecture series to bring young researchers as, as you uh, together and to give them an opportunity to you know showcase their work and to share their passion and their expertise and um, uh, knowledge with the fellow um, imagined professionals so thank you so much for for the great talk for inspirational talk and um on my side, I would also like to thank everyone in the audience for being with us today and also throughout the last months and following the, the QTI lectures. And even though this was our last um, lecture within the same QTI uh, framework, um, we will be back uh, after the holidays with another thematic uh, lecture series uh, on topics beyond quantum. So make sure that you stay tuned uh, for the regular updates um, on quantum.sen website, openlab.sen website, and that you follow our social media channels for more news. <laughs> Um, I would just like to ask one more time if there are no questions to make sure. Uh, please feel free to use this opportunity while we, st while we still have Hannah with us here. Don't be shy. If you don't have any questions, you can pin her message afterwards. Okay. Okay, I see people thanking Hannah in the chat for the nice presentation. Nice, thank you. Okay. And thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you again, Hannah, for your availability and the presentation. Uh, wishing you the best of luck uh, also in the future for, for the research and I uh, hope um, there will be a chance uh, in the future to see you again at some point. Thank you so much for organizing this and for letting me give the talk and uh, hosting it. And uh, yeah, hope to, to see you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, yeah.